Welcome to the next lecture in our series. There are lots of important ideas here, lots of big ideas, so pay close attention. Our previous lecture on the first law of thermodynamics was based on two big ideas. The first one is that the internal energy of a system is a state function, a function of its present state. For example, for a PVT system, the energy of the system is just a function of the pressure, the volume, and the temperature. And the second big idea is that energy is conserved. The change in energy of a system is the heat input minus the work output. The internal energy of the system can only change if the system exchanges energy with its surroundings. Now in this new lecture, we have some new big ideas. The first one is that some processes are reversible and some are irreversible. Now, how do we tell the difference between a reversible and an irreversible process? Well, that's big idea number two, that there exists a state function S that distinguishes between reversible and irreversible processes. A state function distinguishes between different kinds of processes, and that state function is called the entropy. Let's think about the whole situation in the abstract. Let's suppose we have a process that goes from some initial state I through some intermediate stages to some final state F. That process we'll call P it goes from I to F. Well, we say that that process is reversible if another possible process is one that goes from F back to I through all of exactly the same stages. It's ex an exact reverse version of process P, a process we'll call P bar. And the process P is reversible if the process P bar is possible. What kind of processes are reversible? Could the expansion of a PVT system, a fluid for example, be reversible? Well, suppose the PVT system is put into a cylinder with a piston, as we've described before, and it's oriented vertically, and when it expands, it lifts a weight, mg, above the surface of the Earth. For the system to expand, the pressure force inside the system must be big enough to lift the weight. So P times A, the cross-sectional area of the cylinder, must be at least as big as m times g. But if the process is to run in reverse, then the weight has to be big enough to compress the fluid. So P times A must be less than or equal to M times G. So if the process is to be reversible, if it's to be able to run in either direction equally well, then the pressure force, P times A, must be equal to M times G. In other words, the forces have to be in equilibrium for a reversible process to occur. This means, of course, that the expansion of the gas will only happen very, very slowly. It won't be accelerated by an unbalanced force. So to expand a PVT system reversibly, we need to balance the pressure force with an external weight as we lift the weight. But how can we do that if the pressure decreases as the system expands, like we would expect for an ideal gas? Well, we can do it if we're very careful. So suppose we have our fluid, our gas, let's say, in a vertical cylinder with a, with a, that's going to lift a weight, but the weight is actually a pile of sand. And next to the cylinder, there's a vertical stack of little trays, little reservoirs for sand. So to start things out, we remove a tiny amount of sand and put it in the um, the tray at the same level, moving it horizontally so it takes no work to do this. Now the sand pile is a little bit lighter and the gas expands. Now once again we remove a little bit of sand and move it to the reservoir at that same level. And that allows the gas to expand a little more. And so on. We move the sand horizontally to reservoirs to keep the weight of the sand pile and the pressure inside the gas as close to equilibrium as we need to. And in this way, we can expand the gas reversibly even if the pressure is changing. So we can do work reversibly on our surroundings. 
And when we do that, there are some characteristics that we'll find of that process. One is that the work is stored in some kind of potential energy. In the example we just looked at, the gravitational potential energy of lifting the, the weight. And the process happens close to equilibrium. At any given time, it's almost exactly in equilibrium. The force is almost exactly balanced. And finally, the process happens slowly. It's a quasi-static process. So very slow processes happening very close to equilibrium, where the work is stored in some kind of potential energy, are very close to reversible um, um, processes that do work. So much for work. How about heat transfer? Well, heat transfer is even easier to think about. Suppose we have two systems with temperatures Ta and Tb. If the temperatures are equal, then heat can flow from the first to the second one, from A to B, or from B to A. It can flow in either direction equally well. But if system A is warmer than system B, if its temperature is higher, then the heat only flows in one direction. It only flows from A to B. So heat flow between two systems at the same temperature is reversible, but heat flow between systems at different temperatures is not reversible. It only goes from higher temperature to lower temperature. One example of an irreversible process that we've seen is the free expansion of a gas. The gas is initially confined to one half of an enclosure, and we remove the partition, and the gas fills the entire enclosure. Now, that process is okay. That can happen. That's a possible process. But if we replace the partition, the gas does not collect on one side of the, um, of the container. The reverse process doesn't happen. That's not okay. That's, that's impossible. So free expansion is irreversible. Okay, so we have lots of examples now. Um, irreversible process includes free expansion of a gas, or heat flow from hot to cold, or processes involving friction or so, so on. Reversible processes include quasi-static expansion of a gas, or heat flow between systems at the same temperature. Okay, now we want to pick out one of those irreversible processes and, and be a little more careful. We want to make definite the idea that, that it's an irreversible process for heat to flow from a hotter object to a colder object. We want to state that very carefully. But in order to do so, we must be very careful indeed to avoid misunderstandings of what it means. Consider, for example, a refrigerator. This is a device that removes heat from one system, the interior of the refrigerator, and expels heat into another system, the outside world, and, and at first glance that seems to go against the, um, the rule that heat only flows from warmer to colder. Here's heat flowing from colder to warmer. warmer. But a closer analysis reveals that something else also happens during the refrigerator's operation. The refrigerator requires an external source of energy to operate. So it's convenient to think of a refrigerator as a small device R that acts between two thermal reservoirs, the colder interior and the warmer exterior of the refrigerator. And so what happens is that the refrigerator itself, the, the mechanism, operates in a cycle. It has no net change to its own state over one cycle. Now some external agency does work on the machine R during the cycle. And the refrigerator then draws an amount of heat Q from the colder reservoir and expels the total energy W plus Q to the warmer reservoir in the course of its operation. So there's no net change in the energy of R. In fact, it's, it's handy to see how the first law works out for each of the three systems involved in the refrigerator operation. So the warmer reservoir absorbs a heat Q plus W. No work is done by it, and so its change in energy is Q plus W. The colder reservoir absorbs a heat minus Q. Q flows out of the colder reservoir. It also does no work, and so its change in energy is minus Q. The machine R um, uh, absorbs a net amount of heat minus W and does a net amount of work minus W because of the sign conventions both of these are negative 
and the total change in energy of R is zero because R operates in a cycle. So it is possible for heat to flow from a colder system to a warmer system, but only if something else happens. And so this is the basis for what is actually one form of the second law of thermodynamics, first formulated by Clausius uh, back in the 1840s. No process can have as its sole result the transfer of heat from a colder system to a warmer system. It might be that heat goes from a colder system to a warmer system, as in a refrigerator, but that's not its sole result. Here's a kind of disabled sort of refrigerator that does no actual refrigeration. What the machine C does is it takes work as input and then it just expels that energy as heat output into a thermal reservoir of some temperature. Now if you think about it, you'll begin to recognize that C is nothing other than Rumford's Cannon experiment. By the cannon itself is the, is the system C. Work was done on the cannon to drive the boring machine, and heat was expelled by the system because of the friction of the boring head on the interior of the cannon barrel. So this sort of machine is quite possible. We now want to shift our attention from reversible and irreversible processes to reversible and irreversible state changes. But what's the difference? Let's imagine some system that's isolated from the outside world. Its energy remains constant. But the system itself may have many parts. It may have many different fluids that can expand or contract. It may have thermal reservoirs. It may have um, weights that can be lifted or, 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 or lowered, and so on. The, the system may be very, very complicated internally. And let's suppose the system undergoes some change in state, going from its initial state I to a final state F. And there's some process P by which this isolated system goes from I to F. Now P itself is reversible if there's some other process which is, which is just P bar. It's exactly the reverse process. And it goes, goes through exactly the same stages in exactly the reverse order that can take us from F back to I. So P, in this case, is a reversible process. But now suppose that P itself is not necessarily a reversible process. There may not be any P bar. But nevertheless, there is some other process P prime that by a completely different route could take the state F and reconstruct it, uh, reconstruct the state I from it, that the state F could turn into the state I by the other process P prime. If such a process exists, then the original process P it constitutes a reversible state change. It turns out that these two ideas, the irreversibility of a process and the irreversibility of a state change, are intimately connected. In fact, reversible processes always lead to reversible state changes, obviously, since we can just reverse the process. But it's also true that irreversible processes always lead to irreversible state changes. We can tell whether an irreversible process has taken place in an isolated system simply by examining the initial and final states of the system. For example, consider two subsystems of different temperature, and heat flows from the warmer one to the cooler one. Well, we can tell that the heat has flowed from one to the other, just by seeing that the energy content of the cooler one has increased and the energy content of the, of the warmer one has decreased. So by looking at the um, initial and final states of the system, we can tell that this irreversible heat flow has taken place. So, suppose we have a, a system that undergoes some process P from an initial state to a final state. And there's some state property, some property of these two states that lets me know whether P is, is um, reversible or not. And in fact, um, there's a single state function that does the job. The reversibility of P is determined entirely by a single state function called S, the entropy. 
Now, when we talk about entropy, we're making some assumptions about the world. The first assumption is that there's a single numerical quantity, the quantity S, which determines the irreversibility of state changes. That's quite an assumption. And the second assumption that we're going to make is that that state function is additive. If we have a system composed of two subsystems, then the entropy of the whole system is just the sum of the entropy of A plus the entropy of B. Now once we make all these assumptions, then this is how the entropy is going to work. This is how the entropy is going to tell us which state changes are reversible and which ones are irreversible. A state change from an initial state to a final state is reversible only if the entropy itself is unchanged. That the changed entropy, the final entropy minus the initial entropy, is zero. The entropy at the end is the same as the entropy at the beginning. And a state change going from I to F is irreversible if the entropy itself changes. Now, it can only change in one way, and by convention we're going to define the entropy so that only entropy increases are possible. So entropy changes are always greater than or equal to zero, and if they're greater than zero, the state change is irreversible. Let's consider some of the processes we've talked about so far. For example, consider the free expansion of a gas. In the free expansion of a gas, um, uh, we, we can't just reverse the process at all. An irreversible process means it's an irreversible state change, and that means that the change in entropy, delta S, is greater than zero. On the other hand, if the gas expands quasi-statically and does and does work reversibly, arbitrarily close to equilibrium, then that's a reversible process, and the change in entropy of the gas is zero. What about heat transfer between systems? Well, heat transfer between systems of equal temperature is a reversible process, and so the change in entropy of such a process from the beginning state to the ending state should be zero. But if we transfer heat from a warmer system to a colder system, that's an irreversible process. It produces an irreversible state change, and the change in entropy, the difference of the entropy from the, of the final state minus the initial state, that change in entropy is greater than zero. Here's a really useful example, the example of an ideal gas. And the first thing we want to consider is free expansion of an ideal gas, which leaves the energy and the temperature unchanged. So we start with the gas confined to one part of the volume, and then we allow that we remove a partition and we allow it to expand freely into all parts of the gas. It goes from an initial volume VI to a final volume VF. And we argued that that this is an irreversible process, and so that means that the change in entropy of the gas should be greater than zero in free expansion. But the same change in state of the gas could be accomplished in a completely different way, by isothermal expansion, which we can do arbitrarily close to equilibrium in a reversible way. So in addition to the gas, we have, uh, we have some external place we can put work, and we, uh, we have, um, we have a, 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 a heat reservoir, and we slowly and reversibly, and at constant temperature, allow the gas to expand from VI to VF. This is exactly the same change in state of the gas as before, so the entropy of the gas does go up in this process. But notice that heat flows in from the reservoir and work goes out from the gas. Now because this overall process with the reservoir and so on is, is reversible, the total change in entropy of the gas plus the reservoir is equal to zero. The work output has nothing to do with the entropy. It does not change the entropy at all. And because the change in entropy of the gas is positive, that tells us that the change in entropy of the reservoir is negative. Heat flowing out of the reservoir decreases the entropy of the reservoir. So we can draw a general moral about what happens when we exchange heat with a, with a, with a reservoir. When heat flows out of a reservoir, its entropy decreases. And when heat flows into a reservoir, its entropy increases. 
And it's a very reasonable assumption that the amount of change in the entropy is just proportional to the amount of heat that has been um, added to or taken away from the reservoir. That is to say that the change in entropy is some gamma times Q, the heat added to the reservoir. And gamma, which is positive, depends on the properties of the reservoir. We don't yet know what gamma is, but for a particular reservoir, the change in entropy of the reservoir is gamma times Q. Now that's for a thermal reservoir, but how about other systems? Well, any system is effectively a thermal reservoir if the amount of heat that is exchanged is extremely tiny. A tiny amount of heat doesn't affect the temperature of the, uh, of the system very much, for example. And so we can write this same idea in the following way, that ds, the change in entropy of the system, the tiny change in entropy of the system, is gamma times delta q, the tiny amount of heat that flows into the system. And gamma depends on the properties of the system. Now you may notice something strange here. We've written ds for a tiny change in s, but delta q for the amount of heat that is added to the system. What's the difference between d and delta? Well, in fact, the infinitesimal dx in calculus describes a tiny change of a quantity x, a tiny change in x. But the heat is a path function for the system. So this tiny amount of heat that's added to the system, delta Q, is not a change in any property of the state. So we don't use the, the, the same infinitesimal notation to describe it. The entropy is a state function, however, so the tiny amount ds is the change in some property of the state. It's the change in the entropy. So we write ds, but delta Q. And in general, for path functions like heat and work, if we're being very strict, we write delta Q and delta W to mean small amounts of heat and work, which are not themselves changes in anything. But the state functions, like energy and entropy and temperature and pressure and volume, we write small amounts of those as small changes in the state function, DE, DS, and so on. Let's consider heat transfer between two systems, A and B, which have the very same temperature. A, a small amount of heat, delta Q, flows from A to B. Now, because they're at the same temperature, then the heat transfer between them is reversible, and that means that the entropy change must be zero. Well, what is the entropy change? Well, the entropy change of system B is its gamma factor, gamma B, times delta Q. And the entropy change of system A is its gamma factor, gamma A, times delta Q, with a minus sign because heat is flowing out of A. And that means that zero is equal to gamma B minus gamma A times delta Q, which means that these two systems must have the same gamma factor. And that's an amazing fact because I've assumed nothing about these two systems. They could be quite different systems with very different properties. The only thing I've assumed is that they have the same temperature. And that means that gamma, the, the special function gamma that tells you how heat transfer is related to entropy changes, that factor gamma is a function of the temperature only. And that's a remarkable and very useful fact. Now suppose that the heat transfer from A to B is irreversible. The temperature of A is actually higher than the temperature of B. Um, well, let's see. That means that the change in entropy of the system must be positive, must be greater than zero. And so that means that this change in entropy is greater than zero. That means this function here must be greater than zero. That means that the gamma factor for B, which is a function of the temperature B, must be greater than the gamma factor for A. So the higher temperature corresponds to a lower gamma. And that means that we know that the function gamma of T we don't know the function, but the function gamma of T must be a decreasing function of temperature. Higher temperature means lower gamma. Finally, let's talk about what happens to the two systems at different temperatures as heat flows between them. Heat flows out of A, which is at the higher temperature, 
to in, into B, which is at the lower temperature. And, and that causes the temperature of A to decrease and the temperature of B to increase. The temperatures get closer together. But notice that, at, that when, as heat flows, the entropy of the system always increases if heat flows from warmer to colder. So now let's think about that. That means that as the system approaches equilibrium, equal temperatures, the two temperatures get closer together and the entropy of the whole system increases as the temperatures get closer together. What that means is that equilibrium, the, the state of equal temperature, is a state of maximum entropy. It's the state, it's the way of dividing the energy between the two systems for which the entropy of the whole system is as large as possible. That's a, a remarkable result. Okay, that's pretty much it for today. Now, the amazing thing here is that we actually know very little about entropy. We don't know how to calculate it. We don't know the gamma function, the gamma of T, that gives the, the um, proportionality between changes in entropy and heat being added. Um, but even so, the concept of entropy is beginning to, to clear up various ideas about reversible and irreversible processes. So, that's all for this week. Next week, we'll figure out what gamma is and explore the whole subject more deeply.